Christian Broadcast Ministries presents CBM Worship. We invite you to worship with us as we praise and worship our Lord together through music, prayer, and God's Word. We bring you CBM Worship from the Sanctuary of the Wayside Temple, 3809 Maple Avenue in Castalia, Ohio. We pray you'll be blessed and encouraged as we worship our Lord together.
That the tomb is empty. And Lord, even this week as we reflect upon your death, your glorious death on our behalf, Lord, all that was accomplished on the cross would have been of no avail had you not left that tomb empty. Praise your name. You are risen and you are both Lord and God today. You are Redeemer. Praise your name, our Savior. And because you live, we shall live also. We thank you for the hope that's ours in Christ today, Father. We pray your spirit will make it real to us today. And Lord, all this week, draw us to yourself, Lord. And I pray especially, Lord, there's someone perhaps here, young or old, or an adult person, a young person, someone needs Christ, someone watching, listening to this broadcast. They need the Savior. Now, Father, as we proclaim this glorious gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation, all that will believe. Lord, I pray you'll bear witness. And I pray your spirit will draw men and women to the Savior as we lift him up in this place today. We love you, Lord. We rejoice that we have a Savior who is risen, who has conquered death, and has the free gift of eternal life for all who will believe upon him. Thank you, Lord. We praise you and worship you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. If you know he's alive today, can I have a good amen? Amen. That's right. Welcome someone near you with a good smile today and a good handshake as you're able this morning.
Destiny. 
Amen. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, and I want to read um, <clears throat> beginning at verse 22. Acts 17, and beginning at verse 22. And really, I'm just reading this for a launching pad just a little bit. Interesting experience that Paul had here in Athens, but um, as we get into uh, his, um, his interaction with Let's see here, Acts 17, 22, yes, all right. With uh, this crowd, he makes a statement that um, we'll use as the basis of our sermon today. Let's read the text first, Acts 17, beginning at verse 22, down through 34. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, and breath, and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, he overlooked it, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So as Paul preaches here in this famous city of Athens and he reaches out to a pagan culture steeped in idolatry, he preaches to them about the true God, the creator who sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ into the world to be the savior of the world. And as he uh, works with them and teaches them about the God of creation, he comes down to his main point here and he says, he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. That man is the man Christ Jesus, the son of the living God. And he says, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. God has given assurance to all men that he accepts the death of Christ for our full salvation. That's what he's talking about. We have hope beyond this walk of life. He has given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him, Jesus, from the dead. Now, as they're listening, they've been attentive until that point. At that point, the meeting starts breaking up a little bit because some of them began to mock. They began to make fun and they ridiculed Paul's preaching of the resurrection. But while some mocked, there were others who did believe. And we have the names of a couple here that believed and it says and others with them. That's the reality since the work of the church began, as we preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, some mock, but some believe. Now, I'm not with the crowd that mocks today. I'm with the crowd that believes. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. I believe that God so loved this world that he did send his son Jesus into this world to be our Savior. He came with a mission. He was to lay down his life for our salvation, which he accomplished at the cross, 
And there, by the grace of God, Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. Thank you, Jesus. He bore my sin in his body on the tree. He satisfied God's holy and just wrath against all of my sin and the sin of Adam's race. He laid down his life for my salvation. And on that third and appointed morning, God Almighty raised his son from the dead, giving assurance to all men. Now, I want, to preach to you, to, I want to preach to you for just a few minutes today on the subject, how do we know Jesus Christ rose from the dead? The apostles preached that message. The church still preaches that message. It is the hope of all mankind. The hope of mankind is the empty tomb. But how do we know that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Let's talk about that today. But first, let's pray. Father, we thank you for gathering us around your holy word. Now, Lord, as we share this glorious good news today of the resurrection and all this week, Lord, our mind will be upon your substitutional death and Lord, your vicarious death upon the cross where you suffered for us. But Lord, coupled with that is the glorious a reality of your resurrection. Praise your name. Father, we're thankful you raised Jesus from the dead and you gave assurance to all men that because that tomb is empty, the cross is enough. You've raised Jesus from the dead for our justification, and we thank you for it. Now, Lord, we pray as we share in these next few minutes that you will quicken this word to our heart. Lord, what's settled in our heart is not settled in the hearts and minds of many. Perhaps some seated here today, they don't understand. Many that watch and listen. Lord, maybe some will even mock as they did in Paul's day would give us grace and Lord help us to give out the glorious message that Christ is risen. It's a reality. It's a historical fact. And Lord, we can anchor our soul to the hope we have in Christ Jesus, the risen Lord today, because that tomb is empty. Speak to our hearts now in Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen and amen. Now, <clears throat> It should be obvious to you, it's no secret, the entire Christian faith is built upon the reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The claims of Jesus Christ to be the Son of God depend upon his bodily resurrection from the dead. The truthfulness of all Jesus taught also hinges upon his bodily resurrection from the dead. If he did not rise again as he promised, then he is a fraud. And worse than that, we are still in our sins. But this question has far reaching ramifications for the rest of the world as well. If Christ did, did rise again, hear me, if Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, then the question of world religions is over. After all, if Jesus conquered death and as a result validated his unique standing as the God-man, then he is in truth Lord of all. If Christ rose again, then all are accountable to him. If Christ rose again, then all are compelled to worship him and confess him as Lord and Savior. And failure to do so will result in eternal loss. We come then for a brief examination of this most important question. How do we know Jesus Christ rose from the dead? And as we uh, contemplate the death and resurrection of Christ today, ladies and gentlemen, this is the question. Did Jesus Christ raise from the dead? If he rose from the dead, then the question of world religions is over. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way to come to the Father but by him. If he's risen... He is Lord. We are accountable to him. As a matter of fact, I'll say this. Every one of you here today, every one of you watching and listening, everyone on planet Earth today, all men down through history have an appointment with the risen Christ. We must appear before him one day because he's risen and he is Lord. But how do we know? Well, the first um, evidence we come to is the obvious. We have the testimony of the empty tomb. In the attempt to explain away the resurrection, some people actually claim that Jesus never died. That's most unfortunate. The Gospels make it very clear Pilate would not release the body of Jesus from burial until he confirmed his death. Jesus Christ 
died at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And Pilate would not release the body of Jesus until his death was confirmed. Pilate called the centurion in charge to confirm Jesus was dead. Only then did Pilate grant permission for Joseph of Arimathea to take the body for burial. Furthermore, the day following the burial of Jesus, Matthew's gospel states this, quote, The chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Sounds like they're getting nervous to me. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, you have a guard. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch, a guard. Now, <clears throat> Briefly, I should point out, it is a fact of history, Jesus died at the hands of Pontius Pilate. I'm making that point scripturally, but those who try to deny this, they're making a grave mistake. It's utter foolishness for anyone, including the Muslim world, who tries to deny that Jesus died on the cross, and others do the same. But it's utter foolishness for anyone to deny Pilate crucified Jesus. We have the scriptural record, but we also have outside historic record of the death of Christ from secular sources. One source outside the Bible which confirms Jesus died at the hands of Pontius Pilate is the Roman historian named Tacitus who wrote about the burning of Rome. Now, his history is, is pretty extensive and he comments on lots of details of history, but this is the point for today's sermon. He said, rumors began spreading that the Emperor Nero did that. In other words, Nero burned Rome. But, but he blamed the Christians. Nero blamed the Christians. Now, some of you are familiar with this history. Tacitus explained that the name of the Christians came from Christ, who was executed by Pontius Pilate. This historian confirms that Christ died at the hands of Pontius Pilate. There's other things that indicate that. So I just want to make this point. It's very important. There's so much fabricated, so much that goes around uh, that's not factual, not true. And uh, those who try to suggest that Jesus never died on the cross, this is utter foolishness. It's a matter of historical record. Christ died outside the walls of Jerusalem at the hands of Pontius Pilate approximately 2,000 years ago. It's a matter of historic record. He did die at the hands of Pilate. He was taken down from the cross with Pilate's permission and then buried in a tomb by two prominent Jews named Joseph and Nicodemus. Furthermore, this grave site was secured by Pilate, lest anyone tamper with the tomb. Now, the scripture tells us in Matthew's gospel, quote, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And for fear of him, the guards did shake and became as dead men. Those guards wasted no time getting away from the tomb. By the time the women arrived at the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, the guards were apparently gone. And to the surprise of the women arriving first at the tomb that early morning, the great stone covering the entrance to the tomb was rolled away. The scripture says, And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Again, in Luke's gospel, it says of those who entered the sepulcher that they found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Right here is the greatest evidence of the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. His tomb is empty. Later, when the apostles gave powerful witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Now, hear this point. This is very significant. 
Later, when they began to preach, I just read you as Paul was on one of his missionary chairs. He's preaching the resurrection. This is what the this was the heart of the apostles message. Christ Jesus died according to the scriptures, but he rose from the dead. And so uh, as this began to spread and as they began uh, to preach the resurrection uh, powerfully, all the enemies of Christianity need do to stop them was produce the dead body. But they could not. In fact, the empty tomb existed for all of Jerusalem to see. So how could they explain the empty tomb? The only explanation for the empty tomb the enemies of Jesus could come up with was the pathetic idea the disciples stole the body. They actually spread that lie. And believe it or not, some still believe the disciples stole the dead body of Jesus. But just think about the circumstances. I'll review these quickly with you. If you're with me, say amen. In order to steal the body of Jesus from the tomb, the disciples uh, needed to first overpower a band of rugged Roman soldiers guarding the tomb. You've got that mental picture. You can see that in your mind's eye. All right. Then they needed to move the huge stone from the entrance of the tomb. Then they could take the dead body and carry the corpse to some other location with the full knowledge as soon as the Roman authorities caught them they faced death. They faced capital punishment. All of that for a dead man. Not hardly. No, no, my friend. The disciples did not steal the body of Jesus. It's important to make another point right here. The disciples were not in any state of mind to even attempt to steal the body, the dead body of Jesus. Remember, the death of Christ in public humiliation crushed the spirit of the disciples. His death left them confused and disillusioned. They thought Jesus to be the promised Messiah, and now he was dead. His death dashed their hope to pieces. Afraid and uncertain as to what the future held, the disciples hid from the authorities. They possessed neither the motivation nor the means to steal the body of Jesus. Simply stated, the disciples did not steal the dead body of Jesus from that tomb. The real explanation, of course, for the empty tomb is simply this. On the third and appointed morning, the Spirit of God visited that tomb and raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. Now, when news of the resurrection came to Peter and John, they both ran to the tomb. And when John arrived, he looked into the tomb and saw the empty grave clothes. You can get a mental picture of this as well, can you not? They had wrapped his body a few days earlier, prepping for the burial. His body was wrapped in these grave, these linen grave clothes. But when they appeared into this tomb, the stone rolled away. The message that he's gone, his body's not there. His body wasn't there, but the linen clothes were there. Man. Empty. When Peter got there, he went all the way into the sepulcher and not only saw the empty grave clothes, but he saw the napkin that had been around the head of Jesus, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Think about the implications of what they saw. The body of Jesus was gone, and mysteriously, the cloth used to wrap his head was neatly folded and laid aside from the other grave clothes. I think you can get the picture, can you not? Here's what happened. The power of God visited the tomb, quickening the dead body of Jesus, raising him from the dead, leaving the grave clothes behind. Now risen, Jesus removed the napkin or else he picked it up and purposely folded it in place and laid it to the side. Yeah. Then with a mighty earthquake, the angel of the Lord rolled away the stone and the glorified Christ walked out of the tomb. Thus, Jesus said to John the Revelator, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. That's the Lord Jesus today. So the first evidence we have for the resurrection of Christ is the reality of the empty tomb. You see, I pointed out, that let's, let's hurry to the next point. Stay with, if you're still with me, say amen. The next point, next piece of evidence we can offer for the resurrection of Christ, his enemies could not produce his dead body. Um, <clears throat> all they had to do, as I pointed out, was uh, produce the dead body. They could have dispelled 
uh, the idea of a resurrection by doing so. If there was no res resurrection, surely those who painstakingly secured the tomb to prevent such a rumor forever occurring in the first place would follow up on the misguided claims of a resurrection in order to fully embarrass those claiming Jesus rose from the dead. In so doing, the discovery of the remains of Jesus would squelch the preposterous, preposterous claims of the Nazarene who claimed to be the resurrection and the life. You know, they heard those words fall from his lips. The enemies, they had secured the tomb. The tomb is empty. They had painstakingly secured the tomb. If there's no resurrection, produce his dead body. Scour the country, countryside. Chase this thing down until you can produce the dead body of Jesus and put this thing to rest once and for all. However, those who participated in the crucifixion of Christ and had the most invested in destroying his ministry or his memory could not disprove the resurrection. They could not produce his dead body. Remember, all of Jerusalem knew of the death of Jesus. As well, those interested in the facts knew Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent Jew, buried him in his own new sepulcher. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing wasn't done in secret. Christ died in public. He was buried in a very public place by one of the most prominent Jews in the nation at that time. Everybody who had any interest in knowing the facts would have understood these details. No doubt many in the city visited Joseph's tomb for themselves and discovered it was empty. They soon heard the false report instigated by the Pharisees that the disciples came and stole the body. But they knew the tomb was guarded by the Roman authorities. How then were the disciples able to steal the body? And if they did steal the body, why is no one tracking them down and recovering the dead remains to disprove the whole idea of a resurrection? The point is the enemies of Christ could not overcome the reality of the empty tomb. Nothing they put forth could prove a satisfactory explanation. Soon they would be engaged by the bold preaching of eyewitnesses, testifying to them and the world they saw the resurrected Christ. These passionate men were the same ones who watched Jesus die and who just a few weeks earlier hid in fear of their lives at the hands of these same men. Mark this down. The enemies of Christ could not produce his dead body and Jerusalem's well-informed knew this to be the case. Their inability to produce the dead body of Jesus serves as a confirmation of his resurrection. I'll take an amen right there. Besides, while you say amen, I can take a drink of water. <clears throat> we further know Jesus rose from the dead by the testimony of the Roman soldiers guarding the tomb. Matthew's gospel states there was a great earthquake and for, or for the angel, the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And for fear him, the keepers, the guards, did shake and became as dead men. Behold, some of the watch, the guard, came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. Amen. Now note, there was no doubt among the soldiers as to what happened at the gravesite. They felt the earthquake. They saw the stone rolled away. These seasoned Roman soldiers became as dead men in the face of all they experienced. At least part of them went immediately to the chief priests and elders to report the empty tomb. In light of this report, the only option available to the enemies of Christ was an attempt to hide the truth from the general population. How wicked these men. Oh, dressed up in nice garb. I mean, they, they went around in their Sunday best all the time. Oh, yes, but how wicked their hearts are. How devious, how akin to their father, the devil, to instigate a lie, to cover the truth. Amen. However, don't miss this point. The testimony of the Roman soldiers confirms the resurrection. Next, we know Jesus rose from the dead by the testimony of the Jewish rulers who sought to oppress the truth. As previously noted here, I've preached it a little bit this morning. All they had to do was produce the dead body of Jesus. 
In fact, in light of the testimony of the Roman soldiers, now stay with me here. In light of the testimony of the Roman soldiers, these men knew they could never produce the dead body of Jesus. Their actions to facilitate a cover-up actually bear testimony to the reality of the resurrection. Matthew reports this fabricated lie was reported among the Jews until this day. It was certainly circulating in the days of the apostles and some to this very hour try to find some escape from the reality of the resurrection of Christ, trying to avoid the reality that he is the Lord. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the divine Son of God. He is the only Savior of the world. He is the Son of the living God. And his resurrection proves it. But they try to get around that fact. They still cling to such lies as this. This lie was only needed because there was no other way for these wicked men to deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The enemies of Jesus confirmed the resurrection. And then we come to the eyewitness accounts of those who saw and talked with the risen Christ. How do we know Jesus Christ rose from the dead? We know because of the overwhelming testimony of eyewitnesses. Hundreds of people saw Jesus alive from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. The bodily resurrection of Jesus is confirmed by those who saw him, touched him, and talked with him after the resurrection. In particular, the apostles bear witness to the world, uh, to the world of the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Hear the testimony of these men. As John, for example, says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. The apostle Peter said, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. As well, the book of Acts declares with great power, gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. All these men possessed the same conviction, the Jesus they walked with for three and a half years, the Jesus they communed with at the Last Supper, the Jesus they forsook at trial, the Jesus they saw beaten and, and, and humiliated, the Jesus they saw die in shame, the Jesus they knew to be buried in a rich man's tomb was now alive, and they seen him, touched him, talked with him, handled him, confirming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thomas expressed their conviction best when he saw the risen Lord. He bowed at the feet of Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. I'll tell you, that's what I feel like doing uh, just about right now. And I don't know about you, but I do that often in my prayer closet. I bow before the Lord Jesus and I say, my Lord and my God. Yes. Praise his name. Thomas is famous for his skepticism. He did not immediately embrace the truth of the resurrection. Even though the others testified to seeing Christ, he refused to believe until he could see the Lord for himself. A week later, Thomas was confronted by Christ and invited to touch the scars in his body and, and not to doubt, but to believe. And upon seeing the Lord, he bowed at his feet and made that tremendous confession, which is the confession of the authentic church to this day. My Lord. And my God, his doubts were over. He went on to serve as an apostle and an eyewitness to the resurrection. The eyewitness testimony of the apostles and hundreds of others who saw the risen Christ should be enough to convince anyone he rose from the dead. Do you believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead? There's some additional evidence of the resurrection, some of which lies in the mighty works of the apostles. Yes, These works serve to confirm the resurrection of Jesus. Their mighty works in the name of Jesus testify to a living Christ able to intervene in the lives of men and women. 
their testimony and their works in his name bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, the apostles gave their lives as martyrs in testimony to the overwhelming conviction, Jesus rose from the dead. They could not deny what they knew to be true. They could not deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It should also be noted that the church built upon the foundation of the prophets and apostles and Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone, cannot be explained apart from the bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead. The existence of the church for the past 19 centuries bears testimony to the risen Christ who prophesied in his public ministry before his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus made this prophecy. He said, I'll build my church <laughs> and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. A dead man could not build such a church, but the risen Son of God, now seated at the right hand of the Father, can and still is building his church. Amen. Oh, yes, he's risen. Praise the Lord. It'd be all right with me if he just pulled back the veil and I could look right into heaven and see him there now. You know he's there right now. Amen. amen. You know, I think sometimes when you guys don't give me amens, Jesus does. <laughs> yep, yep, I don't doubt it. Praise the Lord. Finally, of course, we have the testimony of the written word of God. Amen. The record God gives of his son in Holy Scripture is emphatic. Jesus arose from the dead. The resurrection of Christ is central to the whole New Testament, which ends with the message of the future revelation of the risen Christ at his second coming. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is beyond doubt, ladies and gentlemen. Only those bent on persisting in willful unbelief deny the resurrection of Christ. But I got good news for you today. Maybe you've went headstrong against the Lord. Maybe you've had an attitude of heart that you're not coming. But I've got good news for you. You can still repent. Amen. Amen. And the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Amen. You know, a good many men, before they got converted and bowed the knee to Christ, they had some pretty harsh things to say against the Lord. They might have fought against him like Saul of Tarsus did. They might have mocked. They might have been a part of the wrong crowd for some time. But the goodness of God leads us to repentance. And today, as you've listened to this message, as we preach the risen Christ, I have full confidence in the work of the Holy Spirit. He does speak. He does prod the heart. And it's his sweet work in our heart that begins to turn us. We wouldn't turn except he works with us. Amen. My friend, you've been going the wrong way. Yes. Caught up in the spirit of this world, rejecting the good news that Christ has died for you and then rose from the dead, but there's something stirring in your heart today Amen. because the spirit of God is dealing with you. And the good news is, is you can come to a place of humble repentance. You can turn today. You can turn. Instead of traveling the road of unbelief, you can come to a place of humble faith in the Son of God. There's a promise. We quote it often. We, as we preach the gospel, it's a familiar verse to us. But some of you need to hear it for the first time, perhaps. It's the promise that all who believe upon the resurrected Christ shall be saved. Amen. The Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. You can have that new life today in Christ if you'll come to him. Let's bow our heads for prayer, shall we? Lord, we thank you for your good word today. Father, we're thankful for a Savior who went to the cross, died for our sins, 
and Lord accomplished on our behalf what was impossible for us. His precious blood has now provided a covering of all of our guilt and sin in your sight. And Lord, your just and holy wrath against all of our sin is fully satisfied by the sacrifice, the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, never to be repeated. The cross is all sufficient. And you raise Jesus from the dead, giving assurance to all men that for Jesus' sake, because of the work of his cross, you will clear us of our guilt, forgive us of our sins, give us eternal life. If we will but bow the knee, turn from our own unbelief and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart you raised him from the dead. Lord, you promised then that we would be saved. Lord, quicken that word to our hearts right now and help young and old hear some watching, listening, wherever they might be, help them to bow their heart and call upon Christ today. Heads are bowed. We're praying for just a moment here this morning. What about you, my friend? Have you had an experience with the risen Christ? You know, this is what Christianity is all about. It's coming to know Christ. It's not just a form. It's not just something we participate on, uh, in, you know, a little bit. Week by week, we go through a form. No, no, Christianity is coming to a place where we actually know Christ. We surrender our heart to Him. We respect the call of the Holy Spirit. Don't be like the crowd, part of that crowd that Paul preached to in Athens. Don't mock. Worse yet, don't neglect. If you respect the word I've preached to you today and you respect the message of the gospel, but yet you've never bowed the knee, you're neglecting to come to Christ, you're going to end up in the same lost condition that all the mockers will find themselves in one day. It's time to yield your heart to Christ. Be like the, the ones that after Paul spoke there in Athens, they looked him up and they said, you know, we believe that word. And they confessed Christ and they believed. There was a turning point. There was a change in their heart. That's Christianity. Will you yield your heart and life to Christ today? I want to invite you to come and pray with me. A decision has to be made. This is just one way to guide individuals to come to Christ. Please don't misunderstand. You don't have to be in a church to be saved. But I'll tell you what you will do if you ever are saved. You will bow the knee to Christ somewhere and you will give your heart and life to Him, calling upon His name. That's what this invitation is all about. And that's why I want you to come today. You see, you may never have another. You may never have another opportunity. If you're in this building today uncertain about your salvation, you've never yielded your heart to Christ, then it's time to come to Him. Will you do it? In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And when we do so, I'm going to ask you to slip from your seat and I want you to come pray with me. Yes, you got to make a choice. You see, those, you see those folks in the reading earlier? They came to Paul. They confessed Christ. You see, they, 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 they did that. They made a decision. You need to do the same thing. You need to come to Christ today. That's what this invitation is about. I don't want you to hesitate. I want you to come. Church, will we continue to pray as we stand together? Let's stand together and you're in a mindset of prayer. And thank you for not disturbing the service this morning unless it's absolutely necessary. We're in a mindset of prayer. Now, right now, if you're in this building, you say, Brother Russ, I've got to come. I've got to confess Christ. I need to come to the Savior. I need to make my decision for Him this morning. He's calling me and I know it. I need to be saved. I want to come right now. Slip out of your seat and come meet me here. We're going to pray together. It has been a blessing for us to worship together this time, and we invite you to come worship with us. 
CBM is located 3809 Maple Avenue in Castalia, easily accessible from State Route 2. Take Route 2 to State Route 101 South and turn left onto Maple Avenue. We would love to have you visit. And don't forget, it's your prayers and gifts of love that bring this program into your home each week. Send your gifts of support, prayer requests, and comments to CBM, Box 247, Castalia, Ohio, 44824. CBM Worship is a production and presentation of Christian Broadcasting Ministries. CBM, proclaiming the Word.